David Mensah is a former director of Labour Friends of Israel, and he's now an official spokesperson for the Israeli government. Yes, that seems pretty weird to me too. Moving on from that particular detail, Mensah has been out on the airwaves defending Israel after they killed seven members of the charity World Central Kitchen, including Free Britons. Here he is on Channel 4 being interviewed by Krishnan Guru Murphy. Is the Israeli government apologising to the families of the aid workers killed, including the three families in Britain? Well, firstly, thank you, Krishnan, for uh, having me on. Uh, from the Prime Minister to the Defence Minister to the spokesman for the uh, Israel Defence Forces, all of us have expressed breast grief about this occurrence. Yes, but are you apologising? Uh, to be frank, to be frank, if you let me answer, Krishnan, there's no point attacking me already. I've just arrived, for heaven's sake. I'm not sake. attacking you. I'm just asking uh, you a simple question. I want no, an answer to it. No, you are. Are you apologising? And allow me to answer. Allow me to answer. We have expressed grief about this operation, but we need to find out exactly what has happened. The Prime Minister, as he came out of hospital today, the Defence Minister and uh, Minister Gallant have all expressed grief. Indeed, there is a sense of grief of, yeah. across the whole country because WKD are one of the good guys. But you... WKD are one of the good guys. All right. so first things first, the people who were killed by Israel were from the organisation World Central Kitchen or WCK. Now, this Israeli spokesperson is confusing them with a British Alcopop drink. Now, he is most definitely, I presume, not indigenous to the Middle East. You're confusing this aid organization for a British Alcopop. The other thing to notice is the arrogance of Mensa, who thinks being asked to apologize for killing seven innocent aid workers is a personal attack. Stop attacking me. I've already said we feel very sad about it. Why should we say sorry? Oh, because saying sorry would mean you accept responsibility, which you are refusing to do, even though everyone in the entire world can see that you intentionally bombed these people. Finally, by calling WCK, yes, WCK, not WKD, by calling them one of the good guys, Mensa is not being very subtle in suggesting that the other 196 aid workers so far killed in Gaza are fair game. Oh no, these guys, these were actually one of the good guys. Yeah, the, the other aid workers, yeah, we kind of we didn't mind killing them. Maybe we even did it on purpose. But these ones, oh, we definitely did do that by accident because these are one of the few aid workers in Gaza who we think deserve to live. Right? Now, the people who Israel doesn't seem to think deserve to live are people from dis disreputable organizations like the United Nations. <laughs> Now, you can see why Israel hired this guy. He's very similar to Elon Levy, the guy who he has replaced. Um, let's go back to the interview. You said this was In unintentional. This so this was a mistake, wasn't it? So you can apologize already. You don't need to know the, the precise details what? to issue an apology. Clearly, there are grieving families clearly tonight. Something, there are grieving families, and we grieve with them because clearly something well, catastrophic uh, has happened. You killed them. Right. Well done, Krishnan Guru Murphy, for getting to the nub of the point. This isn't about, oh, we're grieving for these people because a tragedy has occurred. You killed them, right? You bombed free cars with clear markings that said they were delivering food. Now, whoever was controlling those drones didn't seem to mind. They were still fair game. Seven people are now dead. You can't just say, oh, we're grieving. You did it. Let's go back to that interview. We're going to get to the bottom of this and find out exactly what happened because the, the role of bringing aid to innocent Gazans, to ordinary Gazans, not to Hamas, to the genocidal terror organization Hamas, the, that role is sacrosanct to us, to us. We've got no beef with the people of Gaza, ordinary people. We're trying to get as much aid as we possibly can. I mean, it's not, it's, that, it's not the, sacrosanct. The dilemma, saying things like you're trying to get as much aid as possible is just not true because only a few days ago, the UN's highest court, the ICJ, ordered Israel to, without delay, facilitate humanitarian aid. And tonight, a ship laden with tons of aid is sailing away, and humanitarian organizations are saying it is simply too dangerous for them to carry on supplying aid because you kill their aid workers. So it is just not true to say it's sacrosanct. Uh, it absolutely is uh, sacrosanct because before this... Uh... Uh, war, which we didn't want or didn't ask for. There were about 70 aid trucks of food alone, food alone uh, going into Gaza. Just today, there were 243 yeah, on an those average numbers of are 100. And, uh, no, they're not disputed. They're facts, uh, Krishna. And let, we, we can no, they're not, because the UN said things. that before the war, but there the were 500 facts. trucks going into Gaza and yeah. uh, around 150. So Krishna, I'm talking about food. food now. We're not, yes. sending in, we're not sending in cement anymore. Anyway, I don't we're want to argue about the numbers of trucks. Anymore. 
I'm not because asking you about trust. I'm talking about the fact to build a terror network. Yeah. Uh, concrete has been used to build. Uh, we're not uh, talking a about that network, either right you know, now. We're talking about no, because you you talked, Krishnan, about the aid trucks. We're saying that we're talking about food. There were 70 yeah. before the war. Today, there were 240. Well, again, I must say, the, the 70 before the war food. is a disputed Those number. Those are the facts, Krishnan. Well, it's not no, a fact, not it's a disputed, it's a facts. claim, and it's disputed. Well, and there are Krishnan, contradictory, there are contradictory numbers. What I say is disputed. Let, let's yeah, move but, on to know, the facts, we are, which, we which are, are a democratic that... country with a free press and uh, with, with checks and balances. And, you know, at some point, you've got to uh, take our side over a genocidal uh, terrorist no, organization. we don't take anyone's Original sides where journalists are asking questions. Screw the evidence. The evidence is, is, is irrelevant. You should take our side because we're a democracy, right? Now, that's not how these things should work, right? You need to provide evidence. You can't just say, you should like us because we're like you. And even if it were, I'm not sure a formal democracy, but with an added sprinkle of apartheid, really deserves the benefit of the doubt from anyone. Now, the debate there about trucks was somewhat confusing, which was perhaps Mensa's intention. As far as I can make out, the dispute is over how aid trucks specifically are defined. So everyone agrees more goods we're getting into Gaza before October the 7th than are now, including food. But Israel claims that when it comes to food aid, the number has increased. Now, that is itself disputed, but even if it were true, it's fairly meaningless. That's because Gaza needed much less food aid before October the 7th, because before Israel's genocidal war started, it still had a semblance of a functioning economy. Obviously, it had been under siege for years, so it wasn't a particularly strong or healthy economy, but it had a semblance of a functioning economy. What's clear now, as a result of Monday night's attack, desperately needed aid will shrink even further. As Guru Murphy said, aid ships have been turned around after the killing of international aid workers. And the second largest humanitarian agency in Gaza, Anera, has now ceased its operations entirely. Later in the interview, Krishnan Guru Murphy went on to ask Mensa about the other 196 aid workers killed by Israel. As you can guess, the Israeli spokesperson tried to smear them all. And Mensa also said, Israel were trying to de-radicalize Gaza, presumably by killing everyone. But the interview ended like this. Can I ask you as a matter of fact, did Israel bomb the Iranian consulate in Syria? Uh, so I've got no comment on that, but what I can share okay, with fine. you is that uh, Daniel Hagari uh, said quite clearly that it wasn't a civilian embassy. It was um, a military base for Al-Quds. So while I can't okay, but you're not going to deny or... Uh, no, as I said, that was a military base for the Al-Quds force. Iran, unfortunately, once again, trying to destabilize this region, not for the good of the Palestinian people, not for the good of the, the Arab world at yeah. large, but okay. just to destabilize this region. We're trying to go for peace. We're trying to go for coexistence, but we need to I'm get sorry, rid of David, I'm sorry, David, I've got to cut, of, of cut you off there. Because um, I mean, sure. I'm, I'm trying, just trying to get answers to questions. And if you can't answer the question, Good then I can't allow me. you to do the propaganda bit afterwards. But David Mensa, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> You're such a sweetheart. Us. You're such a sweetheart. Um, uh, Dahlia, do these people actively want to sound like gangsters? I mean, I think saying that he sounds like a gangster is making him sound a lot cooler than he does sound. He's you know, second fiddle to Elon Levy, and it shows. Uh, and I'm also old enough to remember the last time I saw this David Mensah guy, which was when he was squealing at James Schneider for being a lover of evil Hamas, as, you know, James Schneider just sort of sat there looking really bewildered. Um, you know, we're really not sending our best to to Israel when it comes to their spokespeople. Um, in the kind of, in the full clip of that interview, uh, Mensah said something that I thought was very telling which he said, um, as well as de-radicalizing Gaza, um, they also want to return to peace. And so the implication there is that what he, that peace to him is the situation pre-October 7th. And so ultimately what he means by that is that peacetime to him is a blockade by land, sea and air um, that Israel had on Gaza, um, a you know where they could con they controlled the food intake of Gazans to the calorie. They joked about putting Gaza on a diet. Um, when in terms of having um, you know in the West Bank the ongoing confiscation of Palestinian land by illegal settlements. That to David Mensah is peacetime, 
And that's what concerns me is that in over the past five months, Israel has raised the threshold of violence so significantly that the idea of returning to a blockade, um, to such a violation of sovereignty that was the relationship, um, you know, that has been the relationship over the past several decades, um, that that is somehow a peace, like a form of peace. Um, but it could go the other way. It could be that what has happened over the past five months has raised the consciousness of the world so much, you know, of everyday people to realize that what is happening in Gaza and also what is happening in the West Bank is not just this faraway conflict, but it is actually an occupation, an expression of power that is actually very intimately tied to all of our democratic freedoms. We have seen our democratic freedoms being violated, whether it's our freedom to protest, whether it's our freedom um, to be heard by our elected officials, um, that these things have been comp the, the kind of the extent to which um, the kind of ideology and power structure represented by Israel in the US really compromises that for all of us, that none of us are free whilst this occupation is able to continue. So I wonder which way it's going to go. I wonder if the idea of returning back to the kind of de facto form of occupation that we did have um, before October will be considered a return to peace, which is, I'm sure, what the Israelis would want it to, con want it to be considered. Um, or whether there is a renewed consciousness um, that means that not only um, do we want a ceasefire, not only do we demand a ceasefire, not only do we demand um, you know, the end of this genocide, but also a demand to prevent um, and to, to redress the historic injustices um, that has been faced by Gaza, by Palestinians in, and in Gaza and in the West Bank over the past several decades. I just thought that him calling it a return to peace was such a chilling statement and really showed the extent to which um, Palestinians are not human beings in the eyes of David Mensah. But I do think that Palestinians have become more visible in the eyes of everyday people around the world. And I just hope that their vision of what the future for Palestinians should be wins out against the, the likes of David Mensah. I think that's very well put. I mean, I, I think as well, sort of credit where it's due, Christian Guru Murphy's sort of final line, if you can't answer the questions, I can't allow you to do the propaganda bit afterwards, was was very well put. Um, talking of propaganda, I was looking today at David Mensah's former life as a Labour talking head and critic of Jeremy Corbyn. This came up. It's from 2015 in The Telegraph. So why Jeremy Corbyn's rise makes British Jews afraid by someone called Angela Epstein. Now, in the piece... Angela Epstein writes this. Meanwhile, for Jews like me, there's a sense of something sinister in the air. I'd even go so far as to say that the atmosphere could be likened to how the Jews of Germany felt in the early 1930s. Not that I'm suggesting the man now leading the Labour Party is a murderous racist with plans to start a world war or annihilate European Jewry. And I know there will be some who think that invoking memories of the Nazis and by association the Holocaust is at best a cheap shot and at worst utterly deplorable. But look no further than David Mensah, a former director of Labour Friends of Israel, who has just left the party after 20 years as a result of Corbyn's election. As he says, when I listen to Corbyn speak on almost any issue, I get the feeling this is a man who doesn't like my community. So this is someone in 2015 making the argument that Jeremy Corbyn is a racist, a threat to Britain's Jews. What's our evidence? Look no further than David Mensah, this very neutral figure who at the time was a former director of Labour Friends of Israel and is now a literal spokesperson for the Israeli government when they are committing what most people in Britain see as a genocidal war, right? This was the kind of person who was put forward as a reasonable, uh, as a reasonable sort of uh, lodestar for how we should think about Jeremy Corbyn, right? Tells you a lot that that gets into the Telegraph in 2015. Look no further than David Mensah. What's he doing now? He's literally out on our television screens justifying a genocidal war on behalf of the Israeli government, working for the Israeli government.